Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this IIEA webinar on dynamics in the Indo-Pacific, looking at EU and national perspectives. We're delighted to be joined today by George Cunningham, former Strategic Advisor on Asia-Pacific Affairs in the European External Action Service, by Dr. Frédéric Grar, Senior Policy Fellow with the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and by Shada Islam, advisor and analyst on Europe's relations with Asia and Africa. We're very grateful to our speakers for being so generous with their time and uh, taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today. Our panelists will speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we will go to a Q&A with the audience. You will be able to join the Q&A, the discussion, sorry, using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once our speakers have finished their presentations. And please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. I'll now formally introduce our speakers before handing over to them. George Cunningham was, until his recent retirement, a strategic advisor on Asia Pacific affairs in the European External Action Service. He was previously Deputy EU Ambassador to Afghanistan, and before this, he served as EEAS Deputy Head of Division for China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and Mongolia. Dr. Frederic Grar is a Senior Policy Fellow with the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He previously worked at the French Ministry for Europe and External Affairs, where he focused on the Indo-Pacific region. Shada Islam is an advisor and analyst on Europe's relations with Asia and Africa. She is a member of the European Policy Center's Strategic Council and she is a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. So without further ado, let me hand over to our first speaker, George Cunningham. George, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, John. And um, it's really a delight to be with you today, particularly um, as um, the IIEA um, is growing stronger and stronger. And um, I'm going to be giving a presentation concerning um, the European Union's uh, recent um, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. So this was a strategy which was adopted this year. In fact, I was the pen holder for the strategy just before retirement. And it was done in a two-stage process for those of you who uh, follow the EU. First, the council conclusions, which were adopted by the 27 foreign ministers in April, 2021. And then there was a joint communication between the European Commission and the High Representative in September this year. So very, very, very fresh. And uh, the issue is sufficiently important for the European Union to, that it was highlighted by the Commission President, uh, Rosario van der Leyen, at the state of her, the Union address in, uh, in mid-September. So how has this uh, come about and what can we learn from the EU's intentions in the region? But of course, as you well know, um, the Indo-Pacific is uh, the fashionable place to be in terms of uh, international affairs. Uh, but also there are very concrete reasons why uh, people are talking about it. The first, of course, in terms of the US pers perspective is that the EU is the number one investor. It's the top development assistance provider and amongst the biggest traders in the Indo-Pacific region. 
And we define this uh, stretching from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific Island states. That is our definition or the EU's definition. I've just stop saying our because I've, I've left the ES, but nonetheless, it's, uh, I'm still there with that terminology <laughs> or that reference. Um, so in terms of, for instance, uh, investment, uh, there's about 11 trillion, uh, I think, uh, euros worth of investments. And this compares to uh, six of four of the United States. Is it billions or trillions? I don't quite remember. But anyway, it's 11 times the amount of investment that China has so far put into the region and uh, just uh, under half sorry, just uh, double the, what the US has done in the region as well. So it's really uh, a major focus for, for the European Union. And the region, of course, is responsible for two thirds of economic growth. Um, it's the manufacturing hub, uh, central to value supply, uh, global value chains, um, central in terms of the digital economy, and in terms of, of course, CO2 emissions and the whole issue of climate change. So there's a lot going for that region and it's really expanding and if you want the prosperity you talk about the prosperity agenda of the European Union where that's the focus point in terms of um, the fact that if we can invest and if we can do well in trade with the region our own citizens very much benefit from it however there's a lot of geopolitical competition uh, significant strains on trade and supply chains of course COVID-19 had its impact Vulnerabilities, choke points in terms of global trade, 40% of global trade passing through the Straits of Malacca, 30% of global trade passing through the South China Sea. There's no overarching regional security or order. Military spending is rocketing in the region. There's the issue of uh, nuclear non-proliferation and malicious cyber attacks. The universality of human rights is being challenged. And all this is developing uh, increasingly, all these developments are increasingly threatening the stability and security of the region and therefore directly impacting upon the EU's own security and especially economic interests. So countries have been uh, rolling out what they call Indo-Pacific strategies. Japan did it some time ago back in 2007, then Australia 2013, and slowly, slowly India, United States uh, under Trump. Uh, ASEAN came out with its outlook in 2019, New Zealand, UK in 2021, just before the EU strategy came out, and Canada is expecting to have a strategy, Indo-Pacific strategy. Also amongst our, the member states of the European Union, France in 2018, Germany 2020, Netherlands 2020, have Indo-Pacific strategies. And it was the case that when the elections occurred, and uh, Joe Biden, um, it was clear that Joe Biden had won, albeit, of course, there was a great controversy within the United States. The EU produced a new EU-US agenda for global change in December, which said increased EU focus should take place on the challenges and opportunities in the Pacific region, and that will help deepen cooperation with like-minded partners. And so it came about that the EU produced its strategy. Now, you may say it's sort of given that this is an important part of the world, but if you look at the, um, the trade policy produced document produced just before the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy work was done, the focus was very much to the neighbourhood, it was very much to Africa in terms of trade policy at least, and then you had this uh, sort of afterthought, yes, by the way, you have this Asia-Pacific, it was called at the time, and by the way, it's sort of more or less as important as South America. So this was a, over a period of a few months, there was a kind of revolution in terms of thinking um, and uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy came about and it became important. The important thing to note here is that it's a, a strategy for cooperation. The terminology Indo-Pacific is normally uh, a shorthand for anti-China, but it is actually inclusive of China. It's consistent with the EU's uh, 2019 strategic outlook, but also the EU strategy on the Indo-Pacific uh, highlights the importance of working with like-minded partners. And what we say there as well is, um, in particular, partners that have already announced Indo-Pacific approaches of their own, because there is this pragmatic, um, um, this pragmatic approach, principled pragmatism uh, approach, which means also that, of course, in ASEAN, we have a number of countries which aren't entirely um, you know, democratic or have problems with human rights some of which, we, of course, we stay away from, but others, of course, we feel we can cooperate with nonetheless. 
And in that, the strategy uh, shows the importance of the centrality of, of, of ASEAN, highlights that. Now, the way that it's organized is that it's, um, when you talk about Indo-Pacific, people think immediately of security, but the EU strategy is all inclusive in all the areas. We draw upon the palette of all the areas of the European Commission's competences. And so we have different chapters on sustainability and inclusive prosperity, because prosperity is the key thing we have to deliver to our citizens as well. Um, the green transition is there, of course. Ocean governance, digital governance, connectivity, security and defense does have a place. And then we talk about human security, which is the health systems because of COVID-19, the importance of human rights and disaster risk reduction. And all this is underpinned by the usual panoply of partnerships and dialogues. There is an important aspect as well in the strategy about strengthening, strengthening work with regional organizations and also strengthening them because, of course, the EU loves regional organizations and they want to do as much as possible, especially, of course, in intensified cooperation in multilateral fora. So the mutual economic well-being is the center stage of the strategy. And I think the whole, if you read the strategy, especially the joint communication, you see that there is very little mention of China. China does not dominate. What really is all about this joint communication is all about is diversification. It's to say, look at this region. There's so many countries. They're all growing. They all have potential. Let's let's diversify. Let's work with all these countries. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket and 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 deal with with China alone. And also because it has this wide palette, partners can identify areas that want to cooperate with the EU. So we don't say we're throwing all this. Uh, uh, stuff down your throats uh, and you have to do all these things to work with us. We're simply saying, here it is, here are all those areas of cooperation, you choose which ones you like to work with. And I remember that, of course, even at the time before we had the uh, joint communication when I, I left uh, in the summer, we already had India and Japan coming forward with specific suggestions. Okay, we like the, in India it was to do with ocean governments. Yes, we like this idea of cooperating on ocean governments. This is our suggestions. And already this this was very important, not only that we got that support from the region, but we also have the areas in which people might work. And I presume that since my departure, and I'll find out more later uh, about this, uh, there have been some more approaches. So uh, the economic well-being also talks about the sustainable global value chains. It talks about completing trade negotiations. Of course, Australia, there is now a slowdown, of course, because of the un unfortunate uh, situation concerning the nuclear submarines. Of course, it's linked to that, of course. But it talks about, unlike the trade uh, policy document, you compare it <laughs> with the trade policy document that was uh, produced in January. Here, by September, we were talking about, you know, reminding people about Australia and New Zealand, which was in the trade document, but also India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and even eventually an ASEAN region to region uh, trade agreement. So much, much wider. Um, we all talk about economic partnership agreements, Pacific and also the East Africa community, because, of course, we're dealing with that part of the world as well in terms of the strategy. The importance of green alliances in partnerships. There was this green alliance, which has been announced now with Japan. That is continuing. Digital connectivity and horizon European cooperation on research and development with like-minded partners underlined. So this is, this is what's contained. And in the, as I said, in joint communication, Countries are specifically mentioned, we want to do digital partnerships with X, Y, and Z. You'll see that in there, uh, very much um, listed. Now, on the security side, of course, we don't, the EU doesn't have a Navy its own. It relies on the member states. Uh, but work had been done to push forward the agenda there. And uh, the first thing is that we were talking in terms of, for the first time, um, enhancing um, the naval deployments by the EU member states to help protect sea lines of communication and the freedom of navigation. Of course, UNCLOS is mentioned several times, particularly in the uh, joint communication. Um, and, um, and also we're into boosting Indo-Pacific partners' capacity to ensure maritime security. So there are going to be more joint exercises and port calls between Indo-Pacific naval units, as well as EU member states' navies and uh, linked to the EU counter-piracy naval operation at Atalanta and uh, increased uh, participation, we hope, in the EU's military and civilian common and security defense policy missions. 
strengthen cooperation as well on counterterrorism, cybersecurity, maritime security, and crisis management. And uh, we expect that uh, the EU will uh, declare its first maritime area of interest in terms of activity in the Indo-Pacific under the French presidency in early 2022. So the, the, the message is out now and the EU, the 27 member states and the European Parliament are getting the message out to the region. The strategy lays out many options for cooperation. It's been warmly greeted and some have already officially suggested areas to work together. Um, that we are continuing to work in terms of EU summits with India, Japan, US and Canada, bringing the, the agenda forward concerning the Indo-Pacific. And as I mentioned before, the next stage, the critical next stage is the French EU presidency in the first half of 2022, where they expect to hold a major meeting, which hopefully will be physical depending on COVID-19, of the key partners uh, in the Pacific, uh, as well as themselves and the rest of the European Union. Bearing in mind in particular that France, of course, is an Indo-Pacific power of its own, and it has uh, 1.5 million citizens in the region. So I think, um, so to conclude then, the EU is conducting its Sinatra third way doctrine, I think is the way to put it, the third way uh, between the EU, so between the US and China. Uh, but of course, if there is a, a problem that will develop in the region, uh, one can expect, of course, that the EU will lean towards the United States rather than China. Clearly, there is an issue concerning, a problem concerning Brexit, as there is with everything, uh, a problem concerning Brexit. Um, the uh, this departure of the United Kingdom has significantly reduced the number of uh, EU member state uh, naval assets. I would guess something like uh, the Royal Navy had something between a third and 40% of the EU's uh, member combined uh, member state naval strength. And uh, it has, uh, the UK has a go at own policy in the region, despite the desire for close cooperation. And one can envisage that and see that in terms of the uh, aircraft carrier strike force that is uh, operating in that region at the moment. Uh, of course, AUKUS has further rocked the boat unnecessarily uh, and causes uh, an issue just before uh, France takes up the EU presidency. There is a sort of indication of a slowdown in the um, EU-Australia uh, free trade negotiations, uh, and we'll see how that, that works. Um, it is very unfortunate it's happened. It could have been avoided, and it's a really ham-fisted approach that, that was taken, I think. Um, there's also um, the issue in terms of hard security uh, that some member states are worried about precious naval resources because of the fact that, of course, the naval strength of the combined force of the EU has, has reduced. They're worried about uh, precious naval resources being away from potential flashpoints closer to home, Baltic Sea, uh, Black Sea, and so on. Uh, by, they're worried about the fact that this may draw resources away into distant lands and seas far away from those flashpoints. So there is this kind of restraint that's going on. But nonetheless, the whole idea of the EU uh, strategy and also the security aspect has been welcomed. And it was even, uh, I think, this weekend that uh, Prime Minister Kishida of Japan reiterated that, quote, considering the stability of the region, it is extremely important for European and US countries to be interested and involved in Asia's security environment. So I hope that's been helpful to everybody, giving a background to what's going on and uh, look forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say. Thank you very much. George, for what has been a very interesting and helpful presentation um, on the new EU strategy. Um, and I'd now like to give the floor to our second speaker, Dr. Frederic Gra. Frederic, you. you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I, will, I will try to be brief and I will actually be brief. Uh, if we speak of the French strategy in the Indo-Pacific, we're talking of two different things. We're talking of a doctrine and we're talking of a process. Uh, the doctrine is definitely an evolving one based on three documents for those of you who are interested in reading them. The, there is of course a document produced by uh, the French Ministry of Defense, which has sometimes given the impression that the French, the French Indo-Pacific doctrine was all about military. Uh, and there is a document 
uh, or at least there have been at least two documents written by the French Ministry of External Affairs, which take a larger perspective and so on. But the key document to read, because every single orientation is part of that, is the speech of President Emmanuel Macron at Garden Island on May 2nd, 2018. Um, and I'll come back to that. Basically, the doctrine is based, like every doctrine should be, on two different sets of considerations. The first set is French national interest, uh, and they reflect the fact that France is a resident power of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that's a reality that France cannot escape. In other words, for France, the Indo-Pacific is not just a nice diplomatic thing to do, it's not the right thing to say, it's a duty because with population and territories, as well as interest in the region, it has to take that into account. The second aspect of it is the evolving international situation. And clearly um, there we move to the content side of the doctrine. Basically the, uh, the, the doctrine says three things, which are all contained again in Macron's speech, of 2018. First is manage, if possible, if possible collectively, uh, and certainly collectively, China's rights. And this is all contained in that first speech. You know, we should prevent the, we, we should warm against the temptation of any hegemonic way. The, uh, the uh, Silk Road have always been a two-way road and so on and so forth. So the tone was set there. The idea was not to oppose China, the idea was to make sure that China understood its responsibility as a major stakeholder and to the extent possible, rebalance peacefully the relationship with Beijing, which has been the objective all along. Within that objective, there was a second one, which is common to most Indo-Pacific strategy all over the world, which is to manage the alliance with the US. And there are two dimensions there. There is the concern about a US that was since Barack Obama and not Donald Trump disengaging, or at least raising questions as to the reliability of its commitment to the security of the Indo-Pacific, which for the French had a very direct impact on their position there. Uh, and there was, of course, the concern about uh, making sure on the other side that uh, the US would remain committed, of course, to the security of Europe. And those went any name. This is all to say that the French strategy was placed from the very beginning in the ambit of the uh, transatlantic alliance and in connection with the US, no matter what has been said about uh, tragic autonomy and so on and so forth, which basically meant one thing, we want Europe to increase its leverage to have a say in the decision, which is slightly different as autonomy autonomy. Third, uh, try to avoid being caught in the US-China rivalry. I mean, clearly there was a zero, and there is still a zero sum game and perhaps more than ever, a zero sum game which is emerging. And we thought there was neither the interest of France, neither for that matter, the interest of Europe to be caught in that game. And not, I mean, I know that it has been mocked time and again, not create a third way, but at least try to do something, redefine the region in our own terms in order to do something that make any sense. This is a démarche that has been the démarche of every single country which has, had, which has adopted an Indo-Pacific strategy. Take India, take Indonesia, and later on ASEAN, take Australia and so on. This is the very same thing everywhere, right? Uh, how, how did it work? The team around which this was all articulated were what? Multilateralism. I mean, and multilateralism not as a sort of incantation and a reaction against what Trump was doing. Multilateralism as a force multiplier everywhere. And the goal there was not gain the US administration. The goal was the sort of China multi bilateralism that we saw all the time, in which a superpower is in a position to impose its own uh, balance of power, its own strength over the weaker of the, the participants. So multilateralism was definitely an element of that. But also things such as climate change, 
biodiversity, and they were all understood as strategic issues. Take biodiversity, for example, into one very single issue, which is fisheries. Fisheries has become, in many places, the mean by which China has advanced its own geopolitical interest in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, and is now pushing in the Indian Ocean, for example. So here are the kind of issue that seems innocuous because they deal basically with environmental protection and so on. And this is very much the dimension of it, but we go further than that. They are definitely multidimensional issues which have a, a strategic impact. Now, what about the process itself? I mean, the doctrine of the process developed separately, I would say in parallel, because if you look at the chronology, clearly France, for example, had started developing its own set of partnership before it did develop its, uh, its strategy. It did develop uh, a partnership with India a long time ago. It did develop a strategy with, uh, partnership, sorry, with Australia. I'll come back to that in August. And of course, with Japan. And there are also other partnerships in the making, although at a later stage of advancement. Now, of course, Europe was very much part of it. France started pushing for a European strategy in 2018, even if it's only in 2020. And thanks to uh, the fact that Germany and the Netherlands elaborated in then their own strategy and the three countries decided to work together, that things were made possible and that the EU strategy evolved. But that was the goal. And in the process, the intention was to pull also Europe a little more in the Indo-Pacific itself. So the process was a very pragmatic one, recognizing France's own interests as well as own limitation and trying to place the whole thing into the ambit of the transatlantic alliance, which in the French perspective made a lot of sense. And then came AUKUS. And then AUKUS changed all the equation. It changed all the equation not because there was a contract loss. This was not the few billions, which definitely would have upset many people, no matter what it said, that what it did in reality to the sort of uh, uh, partnership network that France was evolving, because it clearly did weaken all the sudden their relationship with Australia. The betrayal once thing and the breach of trust has been underlined many times, but it did concretely finish the kind of organic cooperation that existed because of the technology transfer and the building up of an autonomous uh, submarine industry in Australia. That meant what? That because France was probably the most engaged European country in the region, the strategic link between Europe and the Indo-Pacific was weakened as well. The interesting process, and we at ECFR have done a study on the motivation of all uh, European um, perception of the Indo-Pacific concept. If you speak to many European countries, especially in Central Europe, the Baltic states and so on, they all vote in favor of the concept simply because they see it as a way to buy American commitment to European security. Well, this may evolve now, this may, have, may, this may be changing, but so if you bring, if you break that strategic link in a context where the connection with the US is the most important aspect, one of the most important aspects of your relationship, with the US sending the message that no matter how much you cooperate with it, you don't matter anyway, then you create a serious problem for the cooperation between the EU and the Indo-Pacific. In that sense, that was clearly creating a very different situation. And for France now, part of the issue, I mean, as, as a national uh, entity, it will continue building up on uh, its national strategy, reinforce uh, partnerships, develop new ones, and so on and so forth. As a European member, it will be also to make sure that this is not the process of a debilitating uh, impact on the EU strategy as such. Because if you take out the strategic motivation, the strategic raison d'etre, which in fact is the only one of the uh, EU strategy, of, of any strategy, then you have a separate a set of separate policy whose connection with one another is quite weak. 
and certainly not enough to motivate and turn the EU into an actor. So that's where the problem is. Let's hope that it doesn't go that far, but that's where the problem is now. And that's where the, the way it's being perceived from Paris and after that. Thank you very much, uh, Frederic. It's very helpful to get a perspective from Paris, given the very strong uh, French interests and presence indeed in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so I'll turn now to Shada Islam, our third speaker, um, and invite you to take the floor, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, webinar. It's great to be with George and Frederick on the same panel as well. So let's just get the AUKUS uh, out of the way and, and focus a little bit on the EU. To get AUKUS out of the way, let me just say 35 years of watching Europe's relations with the Asia Pacific, now the Indo Pacific. Uh, I'm not really surprised that there's so much attention being given to this military alliance, because whenever we talk about the Indo-Pacific, the focus is always on military initiatives, hard security, naval exercises, deployment of, uh, um, of uh, battleships and all the rest of it. Whereas the real requirements and all of my Asian colleagues and friends tell me are really economic technology investments. So I'm not surprised that the focus is on, on AUKUS, but I'm also sure and convinced that that's not and it should not deter the European Union and France, if I may so say so, Frederick, from pursuing a, a, a very sophisticated and nuanced strategy, which actually responds to what many countries, I would say most countries in the region really want. The European Union playing a hard security role has always been through member states. And though we have these ambitions now, our strengths really are regulatory market oriented. So I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a long term uh, problem. We now, everything is clear now. Uh, all the lines are clear. Uh, we can see the, the, the light of the day. Uh, we know where the competition is coming from. And uh, I have to say, whereas the EU and Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, is always talking about competition and, and rivalry with China. Now, what we now see very clearly, we're also competing with Global Britain, if I may say so, uh, very strongly with Global Britain. I've always said so. Uh, Global Britain has fantastic diplomats and is going to make an impact in Africa and in, in, in Asia and the Middle East. Let's not be complacent about that. And we also see, uh, as uh, AUKUS has shown, but also as Afghanistan has shown, let's not forget that AUKUS came right on the heels of uh, the rather, I would say, um, careless and, and chaotic and confusing American withdrawal and NATO withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. So there are scars that have been left in this transatlantic relationship. And, um, you know, John, I've been watching this relationship like Frederick and George for 35 to 40 years. And, and it, there've always been competition with the United States in the Indo-Pacific, not just with China, though, of course, we now focus on that. So this third way um, approach that the EU has taken is very much inspired by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, also a multilateral organization. And I think um, the fact that we're saying no binary choice, um, we will work and cooperate when we have to with China, and we will push back and compete when we have to. But that I think also now applies very clearly to global Britain and the United States. So um, I think the key challenge as we go ahead is going to be uh, to find a balance, and this is an ongoing struggle that we've had as Europeans, between the EU's interest in expanding its economic presence, trade investments, uh, key to our job, jobs and growth agenda, now obviously also talking about climate change, biodiversity, fisheries, et cetera. But we have to keep that discussion open, that conversation open, while at the same time, and the strategy says so, we go on and we talk about human rights and you know, uh, the rule of law and democracy in a very fragile region. And I'm not just talking about Myanmar at the moment. I mean, we see populism, like in Europe, expanding in many parts of, uh, in many parts of the Indo-Pacific as well. We have to be very conscious of that and not too complacent about certain countries in the region, which we see as like-minded partners, but which are really on the verge of, uh, I would say, populism uh, and, and, and all that goes with it. Also, um, how do we then balance this interests and values? I mean, that's an ongoing challenge, as I said. 
But there's one new element that very few people connect to geopolitics, but I do, and that's the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, not just an American phenomena, excuse me, Frederick, for saying so, because France and Sitz is just part of a, a woke culture coming in from the US. It is not. Um, but it is waking up the world to the intersection between geopolitics and race and colonialism. And countries which were once, let's say, quite quiet uh, and, and uh, not very vocal about double standards are going to be very vocal now about EU double standards. And I'm not just talking about China. So China will, of course, take the lead and insist that you know when we criticize China for uh, human rights uh, breaches, we look inside our own home as well. So that's a new element that the Indo-Pacific strategy or those who will be implementing it will have to take into account. Uh, more inconvenient and uncomfortable conversations on this with, um, with many in the, in the Indo-Pacific. I think it's very important that we sharpen our profile. Uh, it's not a new thing. We've been Indo-Pacific uh, partners for 35, 40 years. We've had partnerships, trade agreements, um, through security conversations with Asia for a very long time, but it was time to freshen all of this. So I think the Indo-Pacific strategy does that. It's modern, it's updated. I think the EU toolbox is very interesting, also very 21st century, if I may say so. It allows Indo-Pacific countries, as George has said, to pick and choose, mix and match. Um, and it's a toolbox that responds to the 21st century challenges. I especially, and I've been uh, a great fan of the connectivity strategy of the EU for many years now, not just, not just always as a response to the Belt and Road Initiative, I think the norms, the standards, the accountability, the transparency uh, that we bring to this conversation on connectivity could actually be expanded and made more into a multilateral forum. I'm hoping that the Indo-Pacific countries and the EU working together, including China, Japan, and India can work out some kind of a multi um, a multilateral or plurilateral arrangement where they have certain norms and standards for these connectivity projects. So global gateway that the EU is coming out with, I think is going to be a good uh, segue into this conversation. Um, I think we are bringing in uh, a nuanced conversation, as I said, and I hope and I pray that despite AUKUS, um, we do not add to the tensions between the US and China. Those are heated enough without us Europeans pouring more oil onto this fire. And because of that, I think it's very, very good, very important that the court, uh, per se, the court, the, you know, the Australian, Japanese, India, EU, uh, sorry, US format has, is not mentioned. And I do not think the Europeans should be working with Quad. It is very openly anti-China, though they may say it isn't. And I think it's important that we keep our autonomous independence um, identity in the Indo-Pacific as Europeans, very important. Do I do think uh, we should be joining uh, the CPTPP. I think that's very important. It's where the trade uh, standards and norms are set. That's where if China is allowed in, if it does become a member, the, the new era of liberalization that I hope will come in China will be determined. So I think it's important that we do that. I think it's important that we try and see how the RCEP, this Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, deal can work out with us. And EU ASEAN FTA, very, very important. I think we should get over the hurdles and get that done. And then we haven't mentioned ASEM, uh, the Asia Europe meetings. There's going to be an ASEM summit in Cambodia online, presided by Cambodia. And I think the Indo Pacific strategy should be discussed there as well, because that is a very important format, though we tend to um, uh, sometimes underplay it. Um, and, and I think what I do worry about is that we focus on the Indo-Pacific, but we have forgotten the other South Asian countries. George, you've heard me say this before, and I am very, very, um, I think saddened in the sense that we're putting all our eggs into the New Delhi basket, whereas the region per se, um, even though, you know, inter-regional cooperation is quite, uh, it doesn't really take place, if you like, it's trammeled, but still it is about more than a billion, I think it would be 2 billion people in South Asia, a growing middle class, um, very active civil society, great technological leaps, great climate change and biodiversity challenges. Um, I think it's a big mistake uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy not to be more welcoming and more expansive, especially now that we have this Afghanistan uh, issue as well. And finally, 
the great problem is going to be coordination and consultation uh, on this. We have these national strategies um, within the EU. We also have uh, different departments uh, in the European Commission. And uh, you know, the External Action Service may have the lead on some diplomatic issues, George, but uh, the other DGs, and especially DG Trade, DG Move on the connectivity will be very important. So trying to sort of juggle all that, not to mention uh, talking to the Indo-Pacific countries themselves. And I insist on this. I think it's very important that all of this going forward is based on consultation and dialogue with the countries themselves. The days where we could go in and dictate and set out our rules and our agendas is, is far gone. And that means talking to business leaders in the region, Talk, means talking to academic civil society, very important that this can, uh, these discussions take place. So um, I'm all for it. Uh, and I hope that we do see a stronger uh, European Union presence, economic definitely, and why not also security cooperation, but within the limits without really um, intensifying this very heated rivalry and competition between the US and China. Because I can tell you one thing, at one point US and China will get along and um, the group of two will get along, they'll talk to each other, they'll work out a kind of coexistence, a co-accommodation, if you like, and that's where we have to be careful not to be excluded from that as well. Thank you very much.